talent and potential is. I have my sense you need a portfolio. I mean, you're not going to, first of all, you want to have a range of people from just starting out uh, the experienced, expensive ones, if nothing else, because people are going to leave and you need, need the balance. So, you know, if I was trying to do it, I'd, what I try to do myself is pick a couple of people who are expensive and have a lot of skill sets, then get as many young people I can grow into what I want as possible. All right, thank you. And what the hell is DC3 again? <laughs> it's an airplane. <laughs> The Department of Defense Cybercrime Center. In here, I thought you were going to say it was classified. Uh, yeah. You know, li listen to the gentleman from uh, NDU, you know, and talking about the need for a partnership and develop a partnership, and, and we're talking about government and the private sector. And when we say the private sector, um, you know, I'm thinking businesses. And I'm thinking there, there are a hell of a lot of people that are active in this area that they do it just as a result of the interest. Okay. And one of the things I've seen, you know, over the years grow is the open source community, which is, which is driven by interest and collaboration. And I'm wondering, you know, is this a model we're looking at adopting? Okay, are we setting up collaborative programs with people who are basically interested in this stuff and willing to work on it? And if so, what is explicitly, what kind of outreach programs do we have to, like, gather and, and coordinate these folks? So some of the best people I work with in this space are people I met at Burning Man. <laughs> and seriously. And uh, we, I don't know how many of you know, it's a little bit off cyber, but uh, in Haiti, in the Haitian disaster relief, the U.S. Coast Guard, 10 days after the disaster, was launching medical evacuation helicopters off of data being compiled by graduate students at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Boston in a 24-7 voluntary ops center they set up using a situational awareness tool called Ushahidi, open source developed in Kenya for election fraud monitoring, based on data drawn from the slums of Port-au-Prince by SMS texting and Skype, translated worldwide through the Haitian diaspora from Creole, overlaid on images being processed at San Diego State and coordinated with OpenStreetMap. And that was more accurate and timely than what they were getting from their official sources. So the open, good story. So the open source community, the crisis mapping community, this whole uh, open street map, whatever, is a fabulous source uh, that, as a matter of fact, this morning I just had a phone call about how to make sure that the next set of programs for disaster relief we develop have the APIs, the hooks, the metadata handling and all that to be able to take advantage of stuff that we can't even think about now as it's invented on the fly. Great point. Great source. I'd also like to echo what Lynn said. Um, my personal belief is if we look at this from the warfighting construct in terms of irregular or colonials, etc., I mean, take a thing, take a look back and think about if 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 Paul Revere had the internet, I mean, he probably would have tweeted the British are coming and nobody would have known his name. So, I mean, we have to look at tools like that. We have to look at the construct and the mass of the collective. And 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 how can we harness like is there such thing as a digital citizenry? Is there such thing as uh, coming together for the greater good and, and safety of ourselves, our country, our nation. Is that real? I think it is. And, and I think the things that Lynn's doing and some of these other small micro examples give us and demonstrate to us that yes, when people work hard enough on a single end state, things happen. And, and, and it often is done better, more efficiently, and cheaper. So. And just in that same vein, I think there needs to be a change in some of the way the government handles its personnel systems in the sense that we need to be able to tap into people and have them laterally come in to, to, for us to draw on their expertise at mid-career and then maybe go back and not commit to a 20-year career in government or have a way to cycle in and out more you know, smoothly than we now do. I've got a question on the strategic I.O. policy front. Um, it's still hard for me not to call it IW, but I know that's not fashionable. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing what the operators and the policy folks on the panel think about the premise that our control of information, call it classification regimes, but it's kind of bigger than that, around those activities are currently adversely affecting our deterrence posture. Uh, if you don't talk about it at all, I think there's a very real question as to 
what you can achieve with regard to deterrence, and I'd be interested in knowing what you think about that. So are you talking about current actionable information or technologies, processes, um, what direction? Well, you know, I've seen things on the other, on your side of the fence, um, and the degree to which we utterly refuse to talk about, as a country, entire classes of activity, whether we even do it. You know, and I think there are no illusions internationally with so regard to who does what. So the open discussion of capabilities, whether we have them or don't have them, and whether we're exactly. using them or not using them. That is, we are failing at that. But we're getting better. If you go back five, ten years ago, there was virtually no discussions short of what we would have in these types of communities. Uh, today we are having more of that, but we're not anywhere where we need to be in terms of that open discussion of ideas, thoughts, capabilities. Whether we use them or not doesn't matter. But Equities. Talk about them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So just in that vein, uh, General Hayden's talk yesterday at uh, Black Hat, you talked about you know, computer network operations as a triangle of computer network attack, exploitation, and defense. And one of the things that came out of the comprehensive cybersecurity, uh, national cybersecurity initiative, was the ability to talk about CNA and CNE and CND together in an unclassified space. So I take exactly the points made compared to where we were a few years ago. Is it where we need to be? No, but we're making progress. Yeah, it, a few years ago, uh, there's no way that I could have been up on this stage with the unit doing what it does, for the one I command right now. So just the mere fact that I'm sitting here talking with you at all, and that I tell you the title of my unit's the 318th Information Operations Group, in and of itself uh, has a deterrent effect on others and, and other nations too. So, Mike's a real success story. I invented him. <laughs> I convinced him to come out here and go public at Black Hat earlier in his Air Force career, three years ago. And his question was, why should I do this? And I said, because there's a tremendous amount of raw talent to be tapped at DEF CON. Recruit them. How many have you recruited? How many do you still have? Um, you know, the first year that I came here, we, um, we successfully recruited about a dozen people into the uh, Air Force, either as civilians, uh, officers, or um, enlisted personnel. Um, last year, we crested 60. Uh, when we came here, so it was, it, it's a heck of a good uh, good deal because, I mean, let's face it, you get to do what you love to do, you're sanctioned officially for doing it, you know, in a, in a positive way. You, you get to help your country, and oh, by the way, you get paid to do it. So, I mean, it's 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 not a it's it's a really good deal. Spam. Have to jump. Um, so first, I have a. I guess I have a pre-question, which is, what's the I guess lowest regulation height for military transport choppers over a civilian neighborhood? <laughs> That's my pre-question. Treetop. Uh, Treetop. So 50 feet is fine. Mm -hmm. Two light gray military transport choppers. Sure. 50 feet over civilian neighborhood, no, say that's, on July 12th that's not okay. at 1.50 p.m. <laughs> near the 405 Culver and Spolvita. No, um, unless the FBI okay. is coming for you and, and they're going to land in your backyard, then Sorry? no, that's not cool. I don't know. In Fairfax County, I've seen it at so, 50 feet. Are these, black, <laughs> are these black helicopters? No, they're, they're uh, light gray military transports. Right. Two of them. Um, who do I, how do you as a civilian uncleared civilian, how do you go about reporting Heat seeking that? missiles. No, 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 you just, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I'm uh, going to the UAV talk, but I don't just, have it built just, yet, just so. Just move, move your trailer so that you're not on the final approach to poke <laughs> oh. so, <laughs> who do I? So they should be up there about a thousand feet, first off, right? They shouldn't okay. be uh, yeah. zooming your house. Um, and number two, um, talk to me afterward and I can give you the points of okay. contact that you need to report them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, my questions are pretty simple. Uh, when can I wear my shoes when I'm trying to uh, go through security to get onto an airplane? <laughs> and when can I start actually carrying a full-size bottle of shampoo or booze or whatever? <laughs> Sure, real quick, There's a guy in a cave in Afghanistan that can probably answer that question. Yeah. When he stops, cool. i.e., all those things that you do at the airport that I hate and everybody else hates were the manifestation of 
you know, people wanting to hurt us and bring down our aircraft. So um, I agree with you, it's a pain in the ass, but this has to be protective measures. And really, I'd like to ask that question back to the people that are attacking. So, so let me clarify. I, I brought up shoes and liquids because there have been a lot of uh, tests after the fact to talk about what sort of potential for damage there is there or what danger or threat's present. And none of the things seem to be uh, to go beyond other articles of clothing, for example, like a hat or other things that you might not be required to take off, a pair of pants or underwear, right? And so uh, I, I guess what I'm qu uh, my question is broader, and that is at what point are we going to reevaluate uh, some of the, th the things put in place for the purpose of security as to whether or not they're actively uh, achieving that goal and making us safer versus actually just creating a sort of uh, making people feel better. Let me twist your question a little bit. What's that? Let, let, let me answer your question a little bit. Rather than asking the detailed questions, view the process you go through at the airport for security as a miniature memorial service for everyone that was killed during 9-11. Just to add to your question, you know, every day at DHS, and I'm sure they still do this, they have a, a threat briefing, and they're, they take a look at all those things. TSA, as you've seen in the past, they've even made tweaks and adjustments to how they're conducting security at the airport. So there, there's very, some very good reasons based on intelligence sources that they've got coming in. It's not done lightly. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, gentlemen, uh, my question is involving uh, the human capital crisis and cybersecurity report. And just kind of in, um, in reviewing that, I think it's great that the government is trying to build skills in the next generations and recruit from places like DEF CON and things like that. But kind of to frame the, the question correctly, there's a book by a guy named Thomas Kuhn and basically says that in order for a new paradigm shift to happen and for a security in, in this case, to really be effective, all of the old guard ideas kind of have to die off. And like, I think that there's like, through CISSP and a lot of these certifications and things, there's a lot of people that seem to be in government that don't have the practical experience that you're teaching in that report. And I was wondering, since the government also, it's really tough for their employees to die out because like the government basically doesn't fire their employees and they get automatically promoted. How is it from the bottom level that you're going to look at a holistic approach in security? I agree. It's a very long uh, question. I've never received an automatic promotion. I'll, I'll tell you that. Oh, that's right bullshit? Now. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what they told me crap. because I was applying, I guess. Yeah. Let, let me talk to you a little bit about some of the programs we've recently initiated. I mean, the concern that you expressed, the nugget of your concern, I shared. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. This country needs to refocus its emphasis on STEM, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And arts, too, actually, because, you know, but anyways. <laughs> and I know some of you are going to look at me as if I'm the talking history channel, which is a euphemism for old fart, as my good friend Jim referred to me. But back in the day, <laughs> when the Russians launched the Sputnik, I was alive and walking this earth. <laughs> There was a big push by the administration to focus on STEM education. It made a difference. Big investment, big difference. John F. Kennedy, when he was president, said, let's put a man on the moon. We did. Big emphasis on education. We need to refocus and do that. Now, I'm not just saying as a prescription. I'm also going to tell you what we're doing. There's a group called the Centers of Academic Excellence that's co-sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency. That program is under my purview. The number of schools that are in that program, when we started the program about 20 years ago, there were nine. Now there's 117. But the amount, the amount of, excuse me, 121? 125, thank you. And that includes the, uh, the two-year schools that have come in recently, that's a real plus. That's a real plus. But here's the catch. The amount of money that Congress has allocated has not kept up with the growth of the schools. It's like having a dinner party and having one turkey, and instead of inviting five people and feeding them handsomely, you've got 100 people. So there needs to be pressure from the American public to their members of Congress 
to put more money in that Centers of Academic Excellence program. The 